Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Insects After Dark. My name is Margo Rollins, and I am a program coordinator with the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. Until COVID-19 hit all of us, our public events were held on our preserves, either on the Sonoma Mountain Preserve, Fairfield Osborne, or at our Yorkville Mendocino County Preserve, Galbraith. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I will mute you all. I'm hearing noises. Thank you. And um, we are now doing our events virtually, which has allowed us to reach a broader audience in a different way than we have before. And it's really been quite a learning experience for all of us and we're enjoying it immensely. Normally we would pass around a sign-in sheet, but because we don't have you here in the room, or, or on the preserve, may I ask that you all put your name and where you're from into the chat so we can see who's all here. Sometimes what the name is on the, your uh, little screen here doesn't necessarily show your actual name. Before I let Kevin Monroe, our speaker today, take it away, I wanted to just tell you just a few things about the Center for Environmental Inquiry. The, uh, how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you're a student or a parent or an educator, or community member, or you, you work for an organization that might need some, something that we have to offer. The center envisions a North Bay working together toward sustainable solutions. And it invites you to become environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers from all sectors of society by providing enhanced connections to the environment we all live in and resources for how you can build skills to take us toward those sustainable solutions. There are many ways that you can get involved with us. You can do research, you can check, on, check in on seeing if there's some research that you could be doing on the preserves when, when the COVID restrictions are lifted a bit. Uh, there are participating in these programs and even leading one if you are interested in something and you have a skill that you think would fit in to the general outline that we provide for these programs. If you're a student, you can apply for an internship. You can join one of our naturalist training programs. There's lots and lots of things that you can do. And each of you is really a critical element to our ability to address what really are the most challenging environmental issues in history. So today we're going to focus on insects, particularly nocturnal insects, since so many of our insects do play around at night. Um, maybe you've read about the disturbing decline in the number of insects in the world, and maybe you even saw the headline in The Guardian last year, plummeting insect numbers threaten collapse of nature. That was alarming. And something that we need to take very, very seriously. So we've invited Kevin Monroe to come and talk to us today about these insects. Kevin has led several of our programs, both real live ones and virtual ones. When he was the executive director of Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation, and then when he was one of our uh, land management specialists at the Center for Environmental Inquiry, and now he's with the, land, the Nature Conservancy as the director of their Long Island Preserves. Before I let him take it away, I wanna give you a little bit of an outline of what this hour will be. Kevin's gonna speak for about 35 minutes, and then he's gonna give you some ideas of things that you can do that are related to nocturnal insects. And he's gonna let everybody kind of mull that around, do something with it, uh, explore for about 10 minutes. We'll come back together and then we'll have 10 minutes of, of question and answers. If you have questions during Kevin's presentation, feel free to put those into the chat. I know if you're like me, sometimes I fear that I might forget something um, when a question comes up, but stick it in the chat. I will be monitoring that. If there's something that needs immediate attention, such as the sound isn't working or some kind of technical thing, we'll take care of it right then. Otherwise, we're gonna hold the question and answers until the end of Kevin's presentation. I have muted you all and uh, turned off your video. Some of you I see still have your videos on. Um, and you may wanna put, put your view in speaker view so that you can see Kevin large and see his 
screen as he is sharing his screen. Um, know that this is being recorded and it's going to be posted on our website, cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar slash past events. And I'll put that up in the chat room for everybody to, to see. And uh, we'll let you know when it is up. So Kevin, you're on. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. It's really um, exciting to be virtually with you in California. I had a great time out there working with Carrie and Margot and Suzanne and others. And I'm really enjoying now being on Long Island working for Nature Conservancy. It's, I feel lucky that I'm able to kind of still do both things. So I'm going to share my screen here and get the PowerPoint started and we'll jump right in. Okay, Mar Margot, can, can you see the, the slideshow? Excellent. Okay, great. So yeah, so we're going to be talking about insects after dark, obviously today. Um, this sort of the concepts and the insect families we're looking at um, are really applicable throughout North America, but the emphasis is going to be on critters you can see in Northern California. Pretty much all the insects you see photographed will be species you could actually see in Marin, Sonoma, Napa, and Mendocino counties. Um, real quick photo thank you. I really appreciate the photos from CEI that Margot and Suzanne and Carrie and McKaylee sent. Um, and also I was able to borrow some pictures from a few websites like Wikipedia, Singing Insects of North America, um, Songs of Insects, and some Google stock images. So thank you for all those pictures. Okay, let's jump right in. So first, just to, to set the stage, California is such a special place. It's like the Michael Phelps of biodiversity states. <laughs> it's a real champion. It has the highest level of biodiversity in the country and the highest level of um, endemism, which simply means there are more species only found in California than any other state in the country. Um, so it's a really special place, and this means a lot of insects, which is why I mentioned it. There's so many native plants and habitats, it means a lot of insects. So why do insects come out at night? Why don't they just all hang out during the day and sleep at night like the rest of us? Well, the first thing is there's fewer predators, especially birds, so they can sort of escape them at night. It's easier to hide, obviously. There's also lots of food for them. There are other insects for insects to eat and lots of invertebrates, and I've listed a couple there. Other insect, pr other predators that aren't out at night are robber flies and dragonflies, insect predators that insects can escape from at night. Other reasons are that it's cooler at night. Insects like heat to a point, but once it reaches about 90, 95 degrees, they actually slow down a little bit. Plus insects really need humidity and the nights are often a little bit more humid. So they really like that. And their senses are perfect for the night. They're very sensitive to vibrations. Um, some of them have really good hearing and most insects have incredible chemical sensing abilities because of their antenna. Um, so that's a really big reason why they come out at night. And some insects like moths with these amazing antenna can actually pick up the scent of other moths from 30 miles away. For most moths, it's closer to a mile, but for some of them, it's quite far. So they have these amazing chemical sensing abilities. So what insects are you going to see at night? Well, except for butterflies, bees, dragonflies, and damselflies, pretty much all insect groups are out at night. But we're going to focus today on the ones that are most visible, you're most likely to see. And that's the six groups I have listed there, beetles, moths, ichneumon wasps, lacewings, aquatic flyers, crickets, and katydids. Flies and ants are also out at night, but they're less visible and true bugs. Um, are also pretty well hidden, so you just don't see them quite as much. So we're actually, before we start looking at a lot of pictures of moths and beetles and such, we're gonna focus on the insects that you hear, because that's really kind of how your night experience starts when you go out and you're looking for insects. You usually hear them first. 
So orthopterans, which is the order of crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers, those are the ones that are making the sounds at night. Cicadas are what we hear during the day, and cicadas are actually related to aphids, not crickets and grasshoppers, and they're diurnal. diurnal. They sing during the day. So the things you're going to hear at night specifically are tree crickets, field crickets, and katydids. There are cone heads in the Central Valley, but not really where you guys are. So let's look at some of these pictures here, and you can sort of start trying to figure out yourself how they're different as we're looking at them. These are the main groups of what you're going to be hearing there in Northern California. Tree crickets, you can see are sort of um, pale and skinny. And then you have the field cricket, which is sort of dark and chunky. Then you have the katydids, which are green. The meadow katydids always have, almost always have brown top wings. That's one way you can tell them apart. How are they making their sounds? They're making their sounds by rubbing their wings against each other. One wing um, has a scraper, the other has what's called a file. They rub those against each other, that's the sound you hear. Grasshoppers use their hind legs against their wing, but crickets and katydids just use their wings. And they hear because they have little ears basically on their elbows, on the front of their legs, that's how they hear. Okay, so we're actually going to listen now. So this is like you're taking a virtual tour outside. While I'm playing these, I'd be curious to see how you would describe their calls. What do you think their calls sound like? You can just close your eyes and sit back and listen. But if you want, feel free to put in the chat, in the chat box, what you think these sounds sound like. What do they remind you of? So we're going to start with the mud crack field cricket, which I think needs a new name, but. <laughs> now that used to be called the stutter trilling field cricket, and you can sort of imagine from that sound, they've just changed the name in the last couple of months. Here's an other type of cricket that you could hear there. Now we're going to listen to a snowy tree cricket that actually sounds a little bit like that western rock loving field cricket. This is a snowy tree cricket that is warm. Insects are cold-blooded, so their song changes whether they're cold or warm. Here's a warm, snowy tree cricket. Here, that is sort of similar to the field cricket that we just heard. You might figure out your own way to tell them apart. Now you hear that same species when it's cold. That's actually my favorite. That's just such a relaxing sound. Here's the same species when it's hot, when it's a really hot summer night. That and this. The same species as both snowy tree crickets. Now the snowy tree cricket, even when it's hot, is considered a slow chirping species. Here are two fast chirping tree crickets. Kevin, we're not, we're only hearing a little snippet of that. Okay, let me, let me try that one again then. Is that better? It fades.
Yeah. Okay, now what I'm gonna do now, of course, when you're out in the field, you're hearing all these things at the same time. <laughs> so I'm gonna try now to play them all around the same time. Okay, Carrie says if, if she turns, I can't hear them all. Carrie says she can if she turns her sound way up high. So when okay. people are having a hard time, can you can you run it again, Kevin? Sure, sure, yeah. And I can um, hold on. I can actually turn up my volume a little bit too. And people may want to turn it down when when the crickets are finished. But sure. Okay, let me bring the PowerPoint back up. Margot, can can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I see the whole screen, not just this, not just the the whole. Yeah, there you go. Okay, excellent. So let's try a couple of these again. That one's pretty good. Everyone, thanks for your patience. I think I'm going to move on to the next one now. Yeah. So, I, as you can hear, you know, they're making different sounds so the species can find their mate of the same species. Each one of these sounds a little bit different, and the female is listening for the male that makes the sound that she wants to hear. So, it's always the male that's singing. Now, we're going to listen to some katydids. You can see these have very, very different sounds, very different from the crickets. That's the chaparral Katie did. Now we're going to listen to the fork tailed bush Katie did. Here, that one was very quiet. It's just one chirp. That one sounds a little bit to me like a large pair of scissors. <laughs> now this next one I love, this to me sounds like something you might hear in somebody's front lawn. That sounds to me like a lawn sprinkler. I don't know if you all could hear that in there. So each one of these, when they're making this sound, the males sort of have four different reasons to doing, for doing this. They may be sort of making a monotonous call and trying to call the females in from a long distance. <coughs> they may be right next to the female and they'll speed up their sound where they're sort of courting one-on-one. -on -one. Or sometimes they make an especially loud chirp if there's another male and it's sort of an aggressive sound. They're sort of shouting at each other. And they can make a special alert chirp if they're being pounced on by an owl or a whippoorwill, let's say. <coughs> so here's the two largest katydids that are out there in California. The California angle-winged. Those are tree crickets in the background and the katydid is just making one repeated chirp. That's sort of like the shy introverted katydid. 
And then here's the largest one out there. This is the greater angle winged katydid. This one's a little different. Listen carefully. Okay, I'm going to try playing all the katydids at the same time now, which is more natural what you'd actually hear out there. Okay, so those are some of the sounds that you might hear on a California night. And of course, it's one thing to listen to them individually. When you're out in the field, you might be hearing thousands of them sort of all singing at the same time. You can try to become a master at learning them, or you can just enjoy that diversity when you're out there and know there's lots of insects having a fun time and getting together and mating and making babies. <laughs> so if you would like to learn these sounds yourself. These are two great websites you can go to, Singing Insects of North America or Songs of Insects. Between the two of them, they have every single cricket, grasshopper, katydid, conehead in all of North America, hundreds of species, and range maps and photos for each one. So you can get totally lost in there if you're an H peak. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about insects that you might see. The crickets and katydids are mostly gonna be hidden. So they're gonna be all about listening. These are some of the critters that you're gonna see. Beetles are one of the largest groups. There's more species of beetles than all other insects combined. So there's a lot of them. Don't worry about learning all the names. I'm gonna throw some names at you, but just you can sit back and sort of enjoy the diversity and. Um, learn a little bit about some of these beetles. Don't worry about me memorizing all these names. We're just gonna sort of quickly go through kind of a snapshot of some of what you might see in the beetle world at night. So two groups that look sort of like each other because they have long antenna are the glowworms, which on the East Coast we call fireflies, and the longhorned beetles. The glowworms out in California, you don't have the male fireflies that fly around and light in the air. You have the females making blinking lights on the ground, and then the males find them. So those are two different species of, of glowworms that you have in California. And then all the ones sort of on the bottom, the right hand side of your screen, are longhorn beetles, well named as you can see from their long antenna, which they're calling horns here, so long horned or long antenna. One way to tell them apart is the glowworms are soft body. The long horned beetles are harder, and you can sort of see that just from looking at them. The glowworms also have tiny little heads, and the long horned beetles have larger heads. And these are some of the species that you could specifically see right there in uh, Northern California. The grubs of longhorn beetles either live in tree trunks or they eat tree roots. So their, their larvae, their grubs, look sort of like pale caterpillars and they eat um, tree trunks or roots. Two other really neat beetles you can find in the woods are metallic wood boring beetles, really beautiful. Their larvae live inside tree trunks and can make a huge dif difference in a forest. We can think of them as a pest or you can think of them as something that brings balance. I think one thing we've learned, one thing we've learned from these fires is you can have too many trees or forests that are too thick. So some of these insect, quote, pests, unquote, help balance and thin out the forest. And then you have click beetles, which are named because they will click and sort of do somersaults, which, um, can scare a predator if a bird tries to grab them and a click that makes a loud sound and can alarm them. 
They also live in forests. Some click beetle larvae eat metallic wood boring larva. So you got a whole little ecosystem there. Two other common beetles you could see a lot of at night are ground beetles and darkling beetles. Ground beetles are fast because they're predators. They're eating other insects and snails. Darkling beetles are slow because they eat plants and they scavenge, so they don't need to move quickly. If they're alarmed, if they feel threatened, they'll often stick their butt, they'll stick their abdomen straight up in the air and emit sort of a foul tasting um, liquid like that one is there. That's one way to tell them apart. Some other beetles you could see out at night are weevils. It's a huge group. They're always snouted, depending, regardless of what size or color they are, they always have that telltale snout. It's really weird. It's a long beak with jaws on the end. It's the only beetle that has a beak with jaws at the tip of the beak. Then you have scarab beetles, which are chunky. They have clubbed antenna. Their grubs usually live in the soil. If you dig up your lawn and you find white grubs in the soil, that's probably a scarab. They have these really cool clubbed antenna that are incredible chemical sensors. Then you have engraving beetles, which are tiny. That little tiny picture there is twice the size of an engraving beetle. It's a tiny, tiny beetle. They live inside trees, usually under the bark. And then there's the flat bark beetle, which is wonderfully well named. It's flat because it lives under bark. And the one you have in California is red. So these are some of the beetles that you could see, just a small smattering of some of the beetles you could see, each one with a different niche, each one occupying a different place in the ecosystem. So then moths. Again, I'm going to throw a bunch of names at you, but don't feel you have to memorize any of them, just to enjoy the diversity here. Sphinx moths are often seen at night. And one way to tell them is they're pointy. <laughs> their wings are pointy, their head is pointy, their abdomen is pointy. I think of them as the falcons of the moth world. They also have incredibly long tongues, tongues that are sometimes two to three times their length because they're, they're nectar feeders. And then you have the underwing moth, which is well named, bright colors on their underwing to get, scare off predators. They will sit on bark camouflaged with those underwings covered until a bird approaches, then they'll flash those underwings just enough to startle the bird and then they drop or fly away. They are related to tiger moths, which is our next group here. Again, all these pictures I chose because you could actually see these in Northern California. Tiger moths we saw quite a bit of at both Galbraith and Osborne Preserves. Silk moths are another group. They're called that because the caterpillars spin something that is sort of silk-like. And they have these amazing antenna. It's the giant silk moths that can find a female silk moth's pheromones from 30 miles away. They can follow a 30-mile trail of female moth pheromones. Beautiful, beautiful insects. There are 10 moth species for every one butterfly species. So there's many of them. This is a short list of some of the other moth families in orange there on your left hand side of the screen and just a couple pictures. The geometrids, those are the moths that inchworms turn into. So they're called geometrids because they make sort of geometrical shapes from doing their inchworm thing. And then some other neat moths there. The deceptive sallow moth, I love the name. I bet you can guess what it's trying to look like. It's trying to deceive birds by looking like lichen. Again, these are all birds that you, I'm sorry, all moths that you could see right there in Northern California. I just saw a bunch of plume moths here. Actually, all of these families are on the East Coast too. So you could see all these families on both coasts. So some other insects, Ichneumon wasps, you can see at night. This one here is the most common, the orange or short-waisted ichneumon. They lay their eggs in caterpillars. They inject their eggs in caterpillars. Their eggs hatch and eat the caterpillar from the inside out while it's still alive. The guy that made the movie Alien got that idea from reading about ichneumon moths. 
some McNew or Newman wasps, sorry, some McNewman wasps drill straight through wood to lay their eggs inside of beetle grub caterpillars, like the giant McNewman on your screen. They're mostly out at, during the day, but I just had to show them to you because that long overpositor, they don't sting. They're ancient primitive wasps who have not evolved to use their ovipositor as a stinger. Only female wasps can sting because a stinger is a modified ovipositor for laying eggs. Males don't lay eggs, so males don't sting. And ignumens, neither of them sting, males or females. They just use their ovipositor to inject eggs. And again, this one uses the chemical sensing abilities on its antenna and its feet to sense a beetle grub several inches under the wood and then drills through the tree and injects its eggs into that unfortunate beetle grub. I also wanted to show a picture of a crane fly because it looks sort of similar and they can come out at night. All true flies have tiny, almost invisible antenna. So one way to tell a crane fly from an ichneumon is you won't be able to see the crane fly's antenna. Okay, I've grouped together several types of insects that I'm just calling delicate veined flyers because they have sort of delicate veined wings. They look similar. They're not necessarily related, but they look similar, which is why I put them together. The lace wings, they have sort of a rounded body and shape where the caddis fly is a little more pointy and angular. Lace wings are wonderfully named. There's a brown one called a brown lace wing. There's a green one, which is called the green lace wing. And then there's a large one with spots called the giant spotted lace wing. <laughs> lace wings are really beneficial because both the larva and the adults eat aphids, which is great. Caddis flies and mayflies are great environmental indicators because their larva live underwater, like dragonfly larva or like a tadpole. Like a tadpole turns into a frog, caddisfly and mayfly larva turn into these winged adults. Caddisflies look very similar to moths, but their wings are a little different. They don't have scales or powder on their wings. That's one way to tell them apart. So some other of these sort of delicate veined winged flyers. The owl fly, which is probably the weirdest looking insect you're gonna see out there. These huge eyes, hence the name. These long antenna with these little balls on the end, looks like an alien. Dragonfly-like wings. Thick body, which they often stick up in the air to kind of scare you away, bizarre. Dobson flies, which are probably the biggest insects you're gonna see out there. The males have those huge jaws, which they can't use. Females have the much smaller jaws. Fish flies, stone flies, also good environmental indicators. So are insects important? Yes, oh my gosh, they are. They play such an important role. I think you guys probably know about those first three that I've listed, so I thought I would mention, focus on the next two. There are ants that disperse seeds, and some of these plants here, gingers, violets, trillium, bloodroot, they would not be able to reproduce and spread without ants spreading their seeds. And soil help. Caterpillar poop is called frass, <laughs> and sometimes when you're walking through a forest, it might actually sound like it's raining when it's not. That's caterpillar frass raining down on you. It's one of the most important sources of nutrients for forest soil. Forests would be unrecognizable without this nutrient source. And then, of course, dung beetles changing dung into soil. And then you have ichneumon wasps, as I talked about, feeding on beetle grubs. You have ground beetles controlling caterpillar populations, so really important roles in the ecosystem. And then some very specific things they do for us without really meaning to. Chocolate, vanilla, and coffee are all pollinated by little tiny flies. Can you imagine a world without those three? I think that would not be a fun world. And then you have um, hornets that help control caterpillar populations. So hornets are good for something. And dragonflies that are literally saving our lives by eating mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, I would say apart from people, <laughs> are probably the most dangerous animal on the planet because of diseases. And dragonflies spend all day eating mosquitoes. 
So just to come back to this again, insects play this incredibly important role in biodiversity. Insects are a major building block of sustainable, resilient biodiversity. Imagine these landscapes without seed dispersal, without pollination, without soil health. So insects are a really important part of why California is so biodiverse. So how do you attract, study, and conserve insects? Now that we've learned how cool they are, so let's start with how to attract them. And we're gonna talk about sort of three levels. There's attracting them with sort of low things on the ground. There's attracting them at sort of a tree level. And then there's attracting them anywhere. And we're gonna sort of talk about all three of those. So for putting something sort of on the ground, which could just be like right out in your front or backyard, it's called a Burley's funnel. It's very simple, it's a light, a funnel, a screen, a container, and a little capture mechanism. My favorite is the one on the right because it's so simple, it's a desk lamp with a soda bottle cut in half, a little screen in there, and a wet paper towel at the bottom. The insects don't like that bright light. You take soil or leaf matter and you put it in there. They don't like the bright light, so they try to get away from it and they fall down to the cup at the bottom. You take out a magnifying lens, all kinds of really interesting insects you could see. You could get some soil, bring this inside if you wanted. You could build a little toad abode, which is a neat way to attract toads and salamanders and lizards, but you can also have beetles and crickets and caterpillars in there. You can put down cover boards of different sizes, put them in different habitats, a meadow, a forest, near a stream. Really interesting kinds of beetles and earwigs and crickets and caterpillars you could find under there. Moth bait. This is one of my favorites. Carrie and I had a good time doing this at Osborne. You take fruit, beer or rum, some sort of sugar source like molasses or brown sugar. You mix it all together. You really want it to rot and ferment. See all those bubbles? Leave it for like a week to get really nasty. And then you paint it on tree bark anywhere in your yard or anywhere. And if you do this every night for a week or more, moths will start coming to drink this alcohol fruit juice mixture. And that can be a lot of fun to go out at night and see what what comes. And there's also the, the burlap strips you can put on a tree, have caterpillars and beetles come to hide under it. Okay, the thing that's really fun are these black lights. So you could go to a hardware store and a black light for maybe 10 bucks and get one of these sort of apparatuses to hold it in, maybe $30 total. Or you can order this special BioQuip black light. Again, it's from the company BioQuip. And you can hang this up on a sheet. You can Put it on the side of your car with a sheet, again, that illuminates it. You can just tie it to a bucket like some people have done here. You're paying $80 to buy Equip because they have this very special bulb. You can hook it up just to an outlet or to a battery. Mercury vapor, again, that was the black light. This is a mercury vapor light. This is probably the best, but it's very expensive. As you can see, $300. It gets very hot. You can burn yourself if you're not careful. And it might be a fire risk. And with everything going on in California, you could certainly consider this. It's what professionals often use. But I would start, I would go with the black light. That's a lot safer and cheaper, and you're going to get all sorts of cool insects that come to that. So this is a lot of fun. These are pictures from Osborne and Galbraith. It's a fun family or group activity scientists, college and high school students, little kids. It's pretty much for everybody. September and October, probably the best time in Northern California to do this. On the East Coast, you could start in July. As soon as it gets dark, insects start coming out immediately, but it really gets especially cool around one in the morning. So if you can have an extra cup of coffee and stay up late, you can see all sorts of things as the night progresses. So we're almost done here, folks. Just about two more slides. So. Once you have attracted them, how do you study them? Well, you can take pictures, you can make recordings, you can catch them with various types of nets, always have your magnifying lens, including the ones that are also like a container. The beading sheet, it sounds sort of violent, it's not. You just hold that underneath a tree and you shake the branches and insects will fall onto it and then you look at what you found. So it could be called a shaking sheet. 
And then here are some citizen science projects that we're gonna talk about more in a second. So there's lots of ways to study these night insects, including looking at an old insect collection. We don't really need to make new insect collections as much anymore because it's so easy to photograph them. But these old historic insect collections are a great reference and baseline. This one from Osborne shows a fish fly. So you know that when that insect was caught, that was a good indicator of stream health at Osborne. These are some great books and websites. <clears throat> iNaturalist and Bug Guide have millions of entries and will help you identify your picture. You show them the picture and that community will help you. Best book for the West is this wonderful John Muir Laws book. It says Sierra Nevada, but you can use it in Sonoma, Marin, Napa. Really wonderful field guide for all types of animals and plants. Great place to start. <clears throat> now we know insects are wonderful. We wanna study them, how do we conserve them. Pretty basic stuff to do in your neighborhood and to move outward into your community. Reduce pesticides, reduce the size of your lawn and add native plants. And here's some neat water and shelter ideas. You can make a moonlight moth garden. There are some native plants that only bloom at night. They're all white and they're pollinated by moths. You can make yourself a moth garden and go out at night and see what comes. Spread the word, folks. The vast majority of insects in someone's yard are beneficial. Over 85% of the insects you find in your yard are beneficial to you, to your yard. So randomly spraying pesticides in your yard is bad for your yard. And last slide here. I really think of insect gardening, insects in general is the forgotten layer. They're so important to have on our properties. They're the bridges and glue of a healthy landscape. What's this California newt and California toad looking at? Insects. What's this barn swallow feeding its baby? Insects. What's this red bat, which can be found on the east and west coast, daydreaming about? Insect. <laughs> <laughs> its next insect meal. So we're gonna to get to do a little daydreaming now. We're going to have a chance to take some of what you've just heard and learned about, and you're gonna spend about 10 minutes playing around with some of this and then coming back and we're all gonna talk about it. You can just take out a piece of paper and start writing down a rough plan for making your own backyard night study stations. Just sort of do a drawing or a list of what you might do in your yard. You can draw your favorite insect if you just feel like being creative. You can make up your new in, a new insect. You can register with one of these citizen science projects. It takes about two minutes. There's a wonderful one for butterflies and moths. Journey North is migratory insects or North American calling insects on iNaturalists. Really important, fun citizen science projects. It takes you two minutes to register. Or go out on your yard right now and look for some insects and come back and tell us what you found. So that's what we're gonna do for about the next 10 minutes and then come back and talk about it. And yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. It's 2.45 now. So why don't we give it about seven minutes, seven, eight minutes if people could try to be back here a little before 2.50. Um, well, give it 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. come back at 2.55, which will be nine minutes. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up, talk a little bit and wrap up. And Kevin and I will both be staying around later if people have questions and want to discuss a few of the things with us, uh, with him particularly. Uh, we, we will be hanging around, but uh, we will close the program right at 3 o'clock for those of you who need to go. And don't forget, we have the recording. So all of these ideas will be on the recording. I think one of the questions is, do we have a list of project activities? Those will all be on the recording uh, for you to access. And we'll get that up as soon as we can. Okay. So you've got you five minutes to have some fun. And like Margo said, we're not going anywhere. So we can talk to you. We can stay and talk. And there are lots of good questions here, Kevin, for you. Awesome, so I'm not able to see the, the chat, so Margo, feel free to throw well, some questions. I'm gonna wait for people to have a chance to come back before we really Smart. go over those. 
That um, sounds you, good. As you're yeah. screen sharing, I don't believe you can see them. Uh, if you wanted to, people had great comments on the sounds they heard. Um, sounds like a white noise machine, which is true. Uh, someone said that one of them sounded like the striking of a match. And I think that was, and the sprinkler, which you also mentioned the, that. Um, someone said, just reminds me of a summer night outdoors. Oh, wonderful. Caparel Katie did sounded like a zipper. And the yeah. fork wheel, like oh, a I'm glad people had fun with that. That's awesome. Yeah, lots of good, and lots of different people, not just the same people making the same, same one. Uh, sounds like a rain stick. I remember that one, definitely. Uh, and then the, the, those were the kind of fun things that people had to say. Uh, Excellent. And yeah, we'll, we can answer those questions when people come back, like you suggested. Yeah, so people don't, uh, they want to have their, yeah. their answers in there. That's, that's great. And if anybody just decided to stick around instead of going and doing an activity, you're welcome to unmute yourself and um, ask questions now if you'd like. Yeah. But hope, hopefully I'm everybody's not having fun. So if you want to unmute yourself, you feel free to do so. Looks like everybody's off having fun with our activities, which is great. That is good. I went for a walk before the presentation and the woods here where I live in Long Island were echoing with tree crickets mm -hmm. and field crickets. So late summer, fall, it's just a great time to hear these guys. It is. One of the things with your recordings, they, and I didn't realize that when we just beforehand, they only gave us a little teeny snippet. Okay. And I thought that was because they were, they were crickets that I wasn't familiar with and that that's, that they only made little short sounds. Uh, so people didn't get the full impact. Oh, you know what, you know what I bet happened? Yes. When you're doing Zoom, um, Sometimes there's difficulty with the size of a file. I've done Zooms where people have tried to play a sound and it stops almost immediately and you can't hear it. So I think that's what happened because the, the sounds I were playing, some of them went on for like 30 seconds. But I think Zoom was not allowing that whole file to be played. It was too much information, so it stopped. Well, that, that's good to know for next time. Yeah, I just for the... Next I think what I'll do next time is I'll make a recording and I'll have a tape recorder and I'll play them on like a CD or a, or a cassette. Okay. Yeah. People are having a hard time unmuting themselves. Um, I don't know why that is. It may be that you have, as the host have to... Well, it says allow participants to unmute themselves, which okay. I had done. Okay, that so works. Right, there you are, Helen. Okay, good. We got you, we can hear you. You know, uh, I have a question about time uh, for like night activities. If you're trying to plan an event, you said September, October is a good time. Uh, what are other good times? Uh, what are bad, well, rain and bad weather would obviously be bad, but uh, are there times to stay away from? Like, is the middle of summer a bad time? Um, so where where do you live, Helen? Mendocino County. Okay, so yeah, it all has to do with temperature. Insects are cold blooded, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> from sort of like late October through early June, it's kind of cold to have enough insects outside to really make it worth a big group activity. There's insects out at night almost all year, but if you really want to have enough insects for a group. I would say you're looking at August, September, and right up until maybe like the third week of October. Okay. So you're looking for heat, basically. Um, you could start in June, but nights in Mendocino County in June can be pretty cool. So I, I would say probably the middle of July is when you wanna start. And does it make any difference if it's a full moon or any, uh, is there any relationship with the, the moon? That's an excellent question. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm going to guess that it, if it's a dark night, the insects might be more likely to come to your lights because there's less distraction of the moon. 
at the same time on a full moon, there might be more insects out. So it's probably six or one half dozen to the other. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was one of the questions that someone else asked too, was does the presence of the moon make a difference? Yeah, I mean, that's why, in, that's why night insects come to lights because they, they use the moon and the stars to navigate. And so a black light confuses them. They think there's a huge moon <laughs> hanging out on the sheet in your yard. Um, so I, I guess my guess would be a night with no moon might mean more because your light's gonna be so much more impactful on those nights. Okay. For those of you who are back, you should be able to unmute yourselves if you wish to. And you can also uh, put your cameras on if you'd like to. Let me know if you're still having trouble with that. We should have that taken care of. I had a question for Kevin. Sure, Miriam. Um, I'm just curious when that you talk about the moth being able to find the other moth from 30 miles away, like what kind of experiment did they do to figure that out? How did they find out that information? That's an incredibly good question and I have no idea. <laughs> you know, often scientists give statistics and we're like, how did someone find that out? Probably some poor grad student who <laughs> was told there by their professor to find it out. Um, I know they can put little tiny radio transmitters on moths and butterflies and dragonflies. So they may have actually tracked a moth for 30 miles, crazy as that sounds. Um, that's a really good question. I got that statistic from the um, Smithsonian, uh -huh. like the Nat Natural History Museum in DC Smithsonian. So I'm assuming it's trustworthy, but that's a great question. I I'm gonna be staying up at night now trying to figure out how they did that. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. Kevin, let's go uh, quickly out and answer a, a few of these questions. We probably really only have, um, let's see, it is now 240, 254. We have, I, have, I need a minute or so at the end. So we've got about five minutes. I'll take the questions in the order in which they first came in. Sure. So do the katydids all overlap in habitat? It's a great question and no, they do not. Insects are amazing at having um, micro habitats and each having their own niche. So the um, chaparral katydid, well-named, lives in the chaparral. The false katydids, those big ones towards the end that were actually the quietest, they're high up in the trees. The bush katydid is going to be low in the trees. The meadow katydid is in a meadow. So they're able to sort of break up, even one forest is broken into different katydid and cricket zones, different niches, um, that honestly it takes literally millions of years for that kind of ecosystem biodiversity to figure itself out but they each have their own level, their own layer, their own niche. Interesting. Um, Carrie asks us, as I've never seen a flashing insect in California on the ground. Are they in the Bay Area or are they elsewhere in the state? That's a good question. I know that they are in the foothills of the Sierras, so not just the Sierras, but the foothills. I believe that they're there in Mendocino and Marin and Sonoma. Um, I know I've seen similar insects here, and it's very subtle. You really have to look for it. Um, and I think they're most out on humid nights. So that's a good question. I know that they are in the foothills of Northern California, but I'm not quite sure if they are in Sonoma and Marin County. I think so. Okay. okay. A couple of people wanted to know if the crane fly is the same as what we call a mosquito hawk. Yes, it is, and they do not eat hawks. They not eat mosquitoes, you mean? Right, right. They don't. They don't eat hawks either. But no, they, they don't eat mosquitoes. They eat pollen. They're okay. pollen eaters because they look like a giant mosquito. People think they eat mosquitoes, but they're totally harmless. They go to flowers. And someone else said, "Well, aren't those the same as daddy long legs?" They aren't, are they at all? They aren't. Daddy long legs are related to spiders, so they're arachnids where um, crane flies are a type of true fly. So I've heard that some, I've known people that refer to 
um, crane flies as daddy long legs. And so sometimes when I hear the term daddy long legs, I think it could be a crane fly or it could be a cellar spider because some people mean either one. <laughs> but they're not the same. Yeah. Uh, question, are there positives associated with mosquitoes other than just providing food for bats and other critter critters? There are, and I'm also, I'm, I, I'm seeing um, a message from Lee that I think he just sent to me, so I'm gonna answer that real quick. Are mosquitoes active at night? There are some mosquitoes that are out during the day, some at night, it all depends on their prey. What are they feeding on? Is it an animal that's out during the day or the night? Lee also asked if they use echolocation. To my knowledge, no, I may be wrong on that. I do know that moths have special ears on their abdomens to hear the echolocation beeps that bats give off. So moths can hear bats echolocation beeps. I don't think there are insects that do that themselves. I might be wrong. And then Margo, the question you would just ask, are there positives aside from food? Yes, population control. Because mosquitoes carry diseases, there are some animals besides us that die because they're bitten by a mosquito. And in the grand scheme of things, that's really important biological control overall for the planet, even though it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> no. um, and they are also really important prey species for bats and swallows. I've heard there's also medical research looking into like blood clotting or, or the opposite of that um, because of how mosquitoes um, work. And so learning from them to use for medical needs. And then I, th I heard something else about um, clearing out, like their larvae in some ways can actually maybe help water help. Um, but I, I really think the harm outweighs the good, <laughs> personally. <laughs> That's really interesting though, Carrie. I didn't know about the water quality thing. I'm sure there's something there and interesting that we're using it for medical research. I, I see another question in the chat here, Margo. Our local... One more. No, are local, okay, are local insect larvae nocturnal? Um, I think it depends. There are some insect larvae that are coming out just at night and there are plenty that are out during the day. Sometimes when you're out at night, you can actually hear longhorned beetle larvae chomping through a dead tree trunk next to you. You can oh. hear them gnawing from 10 feet away at night. Wow. Oh. Oh. Well, Kevin, I'm gonna have to wrap it up. People, as I said before, Kevin will hang around if you have other questions. And I'm, I hope you can all, uh, have you been trying to unmute yourself? I have tried to allow you all to unmute yourself, but I only see a few of you have done so. So you're, you're welcome to do that if you wanna stay around and talk. And if it's not working, let me know in the chat and I'll try to figure that out. But meanwhile, thank you again, Kevin, very, very much. I hope you all learned a lot. Uh, I certainly did. And it was lots of fun. And I'd be very happy to take any emails afterwards. You should all have my email address and your confirmation emails that came when you registered and also in the email I sent to most of not all of you last night. This is the seventh in our series this year in the fall of Dig Into Nature. We have about 13 remaining of a variety of interest levels. I wanted to just tell you about the ones coming up most recently. Uh, our next one will be next Monday, Intermediate Backyard Photography with Rick and Jerry Waller. It's bound to be fascinating. The first one they did last spring was well attended and very, very interesting. A lot of tips of uh, how to improve your photography. Uh, on October 1st is one of our most popular ever events, Who's Who's in the Oak, with Kate Marionchild, well-known local author of Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. And then we're going to look at ways that you can dig deeply into the seasonality and the weather-related aspects of plants, no. look at no. phenology. And that we're going to be doing with a team of uh, volunteers and researchers from UC Davis's Hopland Research and, Ex and Extension Center, and that will be on the 8th. So go to our website, look at the program, sign up for those that you uh, have an interest in, and hang out here, and we will continue our conversation with Kevin. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. And I just really wanted to thank everyone for their beautiful ideas in the chat box about the Katie did and cricket sound.